this time to get our Bible study. Before we begin, we'll do that later. Reverend Leverock, servant, stand in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us to this day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us once again to your house to hear your word and talk. Pray now and ask God that you touch past and help us to teach that which you've given him. Help us, Lord God, to listen, to hear, understand it, receive it, Lord God. Move in each and every life, Lord. We'll give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Welcome to Bible study. Okay. Okay. So last week, last week, give a small recap of last week's Bible study. We talked about tithing. Talked about tithing being a 10% of what you earn. Before taxes, before deductions, every paycheck. First and 15. So these are different things that we learn and we, we study about and how the Bible talks about even that tithe was paid even before the law. Even before the law was established, that tithe was paid by Abraham, uh, was paid by Jacob, and different ones throughout the Old Testament. How God established it in the time of Moses and also how it continued into the New Testament as well. A lot of people tried to say that tithing is... Oh, it was done away with, it was under the law, this kind of thing. But uh, uh, Revelation. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9 gives us a better understanding of how things are to be as far as tithing goes. We went into it a lot and jumped around from um, different points of the Bible and the definitions and different things. So if you were not here and you would like that information, get with me after service or after Bible study. But this evening, we'll be talking about a subject that is familiar to some of us, and um, it, talking about marriage. Now, this, I want to I give you a dis, uh, disclaimer. I am not Gary Chapman. I, I am not here to give you marriage counseling, marriage advice. I'm only here to give you what the Word of God says about marriage. Here to help you to understand what it is and how and when it was instituted. The points of it and different things as we go through it. We believe that marriage has been instituted directly by God. This church defines marriage as the exclusive conventional union of a man and a woman. Yeah. In which such union is a lifetime commitment. A lifetime commitment. A civil government's sanction of a union will be recognized as a legitimate marriage by the church only in the extent that it remains consistent that it remains consistent with the definition of marriage found in the word of God not what society defines marriage as not what the world thinks marriage is as you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 we'll, we'll begin right there in the beginning right in the garden of Eden where marriage was a officially signed off on, pretty much. Genesis chapter 21, verses 27 and 28. It says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now it's interesting that they're trying to incorporate different things into marriage. Nowadays you see how... Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Is it 21? Okay, Genesis chapter 1. Okay. Verses 27 through 28. Okay. We can see here that God created man and woman. Male and female, as it says here in the Bible. And though society has tried to introduce different things into a marriage, it is unscientifical, or it is impossible for two men to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. It is unfruitful. I mean, it is un. Biblical for two women to try to get together and be fruitful and multiply. Now there are different things that can happen, that they can go see the specialist, and different things take place. I'm not saying that 
they cannot become pregnant, other, whatever. I'm, I'm not a scientist and I, I've read different things, but I'm here to tell you that God created this man and woman to be fruitful and to multiply, to replenish the earth. And I have here, it says, wrong is wrong, even if everyone's doing it. Amen. Which goes on to say that right is still right, even though no one does it. That just because the world says it's okay, does not make it right before God. Just because everybody wants to dismiss and say, oh, well, I have the right to choose who I love. This is as a personal preference. But biblically, to be a Christian, that right is still right, and marriage is still between a man and a woman. Amen. Genesis chapter 2 is right in the next chapter over. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 24. Make sure I get my references correct. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Help me. I'm making somebody to be there to help him. Not, he did say, man's alone, so I'm going to make him a servant. I'm going to make him a slave. I'm going to make him one that he can command and rule around. Because as a man, that woman that we have or aspire to have is there as a help meet. Amen. And we'll get into that and the definition of that and um, some more of that, but I want to continue reading. Where it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. God gave, excuse me, Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman. And brought her unto Adam. And this is amazing what Adam said when he seen him. I'm pretty sure that God did not make some ugly creature. I'm sure that Adam instantly was like, whoa, who is that? Hey, how you doing? He says, this is now a bone of my bone. She is a part of me. You know, a help me God made for him. Not somebody to beat around and to rule around and to be mean and cruel to. That she is on that same level of creation as Adam was. She was not any, anything superior or inferior, but they were on that same level of, of being, especially in the eyes of God. This is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be one. That means, that means, it's, it's amazing that it says this here, because neither one of them had a father or a mother. They were created both by God, but he says that they were going to leave their natural state of where they grew up, especially for us. Shall leave father and mother. I take this as, hey, why do you have half of your family or half of their family in your relationships? This is a relationship and a marriage between two. Now, I get advice. I get advice. Hey, hey I get advice. You know? Everybody sees the first marriage or the first couple as their parents. You know? And a lot of people get that influence from their parents, from what they've seen or grandparents or whoever raised you or whoever you were around most of. But it says that a man will leave his father and his mother, which by nature, the woman will leave that father and mother that she had as well, cleaving to her husband. And says, hey, don't, don't bring all these people into your marriage because the outsiders tend to influence the decisions that are made in your immediate family, between your wife and your children. Again, advice is great to a certain extent. Now I want to talk about this help me. This help me that was created for Adam and she was made to be a help. A counterpart for him, a counterpart, significant, the significant other, his other half, 
The completion, it says these two shall be one. So now that he was married or had this partner with him, they were com he was complete. Because it said that he named all the animals, but for what, there was found none for him. There was no mate or no, no, no person there, no being there that was made for him until God decided to create this woman specifically for him. So, a suitable wife is a helpmeet from the Lord. That she's coming from the Lord, that the relationship is like, is likely to be comfortable, more comfortable, when it's, you know, it's like, oh, well, it's meant to be. It's meant to be. People say that all the time, right? Oh, it's just meant to be. We just connected. It's a great thing to be connected. Especially when you're thinking about marriage or hoping to not be alone. But we as men have to learn how to receive help from these helpings. Young men, we have to learn how to not be so stubborn, not be so hard-headed, so strong-willed, because the women are great problem solvers. They really are. They overthink things so much that they have every avenue covered. It's, it's amazing. And they, they, they do this without even thinking about it. They, they problem solve and they find solutions and you're like, man, you're you're beating your head up and you're just, it's like, hey, come on. I, I need you. I'm having this issue, I'm having this, and sometimes we get, um, they call them brain farts. You know, we, we can't think properly, we're, we're so much in this situation that we're in the box, we can't think outside the box. So having other eyes to help us helps. But we have, to, we have to put down that pride. Have to put down that pride of being the macho man. Of being, I'm the one in charge. It's me, I'm, I'm the leader, right? No. That we are, they're, again, they're on the same level as we are. And also, she is our helper, not our slave. That we say, cooking and cleaning and dishes, that's not just a woman's job. That's not just a woman's job. That it's up to the man to help also. This is, a, this is a give and take relationship. Why should she have to do all of the work? You know, yeah, I work. Yeah, the man works long, extensive hours to provide for the family. But that doesn't mean that he can come home, sit like King Tut, and have everybody cater to him. You know, it doesn't mean that. Because what, what he doesn't realize is that she's been home all day, tending to the kids, tending to the house, tending to different things, and she needs a break too. So these things that it, it helps us to realize that she's not our slave. That makes that and it means that we are not tyrants. Hey, do this because of that, blah, blah, and we're coming all down on her, knife handing her, you know, all of these different things, but we are being careful and concerned about her. We're learning how to contribute as men. They, they, they say the role of a man is, or the role of a woman is to take care of home and do these different things. But it's, it's both of your job to take care of the home. It's both of your job to make sure things are running smoothly and properly. Cleaning up after ourselves, wiping the sink when we're done. You know, scrubbing the toilet if you've dropped the bomb. Doing these different things. The little things help. The little things help. They go a long way. And it shows the appreciation. Yeah, I appreciate you. I know that you've done a lot. You do a lot. Let me help you. You know? I have to be asked a lot. You know, sometimes my lazy bone kicks in. And I just want to sit on the couch and relax. And rest. And veg, as they call it. These different things. But we have to make sure that we're contributing as well. But, here again, ladies, ladies, we have, y'all have to remember that you're not his mother. You're not his mother, you're his wife. Mm -hmm. That as far as the bossiness and the, and the, and the trying to do these different things, it's, it's, hey, we do it together in love and in respect for one another, you know? But I, I want to get into this little bit here. Um, Genesis chapter 3, so I hope you didn't go far from Genesis. We're just going to truck through the Bible. Just and, and forgive me if I go over just a little bit. You know what? We may have to have a part two. <laughs> just, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. You know, and 
and we're just talking about the basic things of marriage. The basic things of how to, how to be, you know, in a relationship with somebody else that's totally different than you are. You know, different, the, the way they think is different. The way they grew up is different. How they were taught and trained is totally different. Like, wait, nah, why are you doing it that way? I didn't do it like that when I grew up. My mom didn't do it that way. Well, I'm not your mom. I'm not your daddy. I'm different. We're different. We have, you have to learn as a couple how to use the differences to your advantage. Use the differences to your advantage. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Almost at 6. 16. He says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. That was the point I wanted to make. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Again, this is not ruling with a rod of iron. This is not coming out here like Napoleon and being a dictator. No. But, but if you look, if we, if we look, okay, go to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. Next chapter over. I want to talk about that word desire. That when people read that word, and, and your desire shall be toward, to thy husband, they're like, oh, yes, I desire him. That means I, I want him, right? No. That's not the desire that the Bible talks about. It says, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, If thou doest well, this is God talking to Cain, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. And to thee shall be his desire. That, that urge to want to control and to rule and to have possession over, that's what that word desire means. That when, when God gave Eve that curse and said, thy desire shall be to thy husband, that it's going to be in her heart to want to be the boss. Isn't that right, ladies? You don't have to say amen because I know it's true. <laughs> it's, it's in there it's, in, it's, it's that nature To want to be the boss But the Bible says that the man Shall rule over them Now I was looking things up I was looking things up and again At that time I'm sure they had a, a great relationship I'm sure Adam and Eve Had the best marriage and they would talk to each other, and they would be there, and they would hang out, and he'd show her all the different animals that he named, and they would just go through and be social butterflies. That's what God created man to be. Not socially awkward, but social butterflies. Being able to talk to people, different ones. But we can see in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3 that she didn't necessarily listen to her husband. That she didn't listen to him. And, and, and the words that God spoke about that tree that they were supposed to stay away from. So here, they, the, the different commentators begin to point out the fact that the desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee as he was no longer going to be as gentle as he once was. That he was going to be that leadership over her and, and the determination of her will will be yielded to her husband. You know, these different things, and Paul would go in to talk about it, and we have it all here, but I'm, I'm not going to get to it all in 12 minutes. <laughs> I'm not. But, as, as, as ladies, you have to realize that being Christians, being Christians helps the submissiveness, helps you to be submissive to your own husbands. But, as Christians, men, the Bible talks about knowing how to love your wife, knowing how to be there for her, be that support group, be that one she can go to when she needs a shoulder to cry on. You know, we have to remember that men and women are totally different, that women are from Venus, men are from Mars, and it, 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 it almost really seems as if we're from two different planets. That the women, they, they, when they talk about things, that, that helps them. That helps them to, to, 
um, analyze different things and they can sometimes find solutions by talking about their issues. When men hear women talking about their problems, oh, why are you always complaining? You're complaining. Let me, let, let's find a solution for it right now. Let's find it here. If you do this and you do that, see, men are problem solvers. Men are problem solvers. So men have a, have a thing about when the women talks to them, they feel like they have to solve the problem. I have to solve it. She, she's going through something. Let me solve it for you. She's like, I don't need that. I just want to talk. I want to get it off my chest. These different things. And also, men have a problem with not being able to find solutions. So when they do, what happens? They just go off on their own. And we get to a quiet place. My quiet place is in here. Right here. It's my quiet place. Come in and get my thoughts together. You know? Sometimes I don't talk as much as I should, or I tell her, hey, I'm going to the office. You know? I need I need I need to get alone in my cave for a little while to, to get some things going on in my mind. And she's like, oh man, he hates me. If you hate me, just say that. You know, if you don't love me, then say that. These different things that women don't understand about the man. Man needs his quiet time. Women like to talk. These different things, we have to remember that we're from two different places. We have two different mindsets, two different makeups, two different uh, things going on, you know? So we have to remember that. Remembering these things. And also, being able to tend to the needs of our spouse. Or tend to the needs of others. First Corinthians chapter 7 1 Corinthians chapter 7, they call this mm, the marriage chapter. It goes for, talks about for the single people, talks about for the married people. For the married people that are with unsaved spouses, for married people that, um, um, that, have, that are having an issue with their spouse and the spouse leaves them. and All of these different things, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 covers all of this. But here in verse 32 through 34, he begins to talk a little bit about tending to the needs of your spouse. So say, he that is unmarried, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, or how he may care for God and the things of God and the work of God and all of these different things. But he that is married careth for the things of the world. That are of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, he's not talking about sin, that I'm caring for the things of the world, but he's caring about, and I have to put my attention toward a job, put my attention toward my spouse, put my attention toward my children if I have any. These different aspects that now his attention is being pulled between the two, God and the spouse. And then also, he says, there is a difference also between a wife or a woman that is married and a virgin, one that is not married. The unwoman, the un, excuse me, the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cared for the things of the world, how she may please her husband again. That we have to make sure, especially if you're married, especially if you are in a relationship that we're tending to the things of God. Because life happens, life gets busy. We have to work, we have the kids, we have the wife and our husband, we have to do things. Oh man, now I have a leave. Now I gotta fix my house. Now I have a car problem. I gotta go. All of these different things. But we have to make sure that Christ is in the center of it all. Because without God being in the center, everything else is just empty. Everything else is just void. And then they talk about different things and that, that, perfect, that perfect triangle with God being in the center of the relationship. And as the, the husband and the wife get closer to God, they get closer to each other. Mm -hmm. In a relationship, if you're going up two sides of a, of a triangle or an angle here, that if, if one is progressing closer to God and the other one it tends to, to backslide or go off a little bit, they're not growing closer together. You know, and the Bible talks about being unequally yoked. Be it, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to read it with me. I want you to see it for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. But before we get there, I have just a, a 
few things to say about tending to the needs of our spouses or those that we're in relationships with. Young men, women, married, unmarried, we need to learn what they call love languages. Love languages. Because if you learn the language of love for somebody else, then they will feel the love that you have for them. Now, for me and Reverend Leverock to have a good relationship, if I know that he likes gifts, and he feels loved, and he feels cared about when I give him things, why not stop at Bargain Hunt, Dollar Tree, uh, the Walmart discount section, and just buy him something nice? Hey, thinking about you, sir. Hey, you know, do these different things. And he's like, oh, man, this, he really cares about me. He really, he, he really concerned, you know, these different things. But if, if he likes to spend quality time with me, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm always busy, but I always give him things, he's going to be like, man, this guy hates me. And me, I'm like, well, I'm buying him stuff. I'm trying to have that connection. I'm doing things for him, right? He should know that I love him. It doesn't work that way. Same thing with it in a relationship. That if you're doing something that is not their love language or not the way that they feel love, then that's how a lot of relationships begin to go astray. They don't love me anymore. They, in the beginning, they were, they, were, they were doing all of these things for me and... Uh, there's one called acts of service, doing things for people, you know, small things even, different things and, and all of that. And they used to do that. They used to open the door for me. They used to do these different things. And now that we're married, man, they don't even do it anymore. They don't love me. They don't care. All of these different thoughts go into the mind of not just the woman, but the man as well. But if you learn, if we learn, if we, I'm not just going to say you, we learn how to speak that love language properly, the relationship becomes easier. The relationship becomes easier. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, for you all, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will deliver, I, excuse me, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the, living, saith the uh, Lord Almighty. So he was letting them know that what fellowship do we have, and he's talking about being yoked together, being brought together, Back, back when they used to farm before John Deere came around, they would actually have oxen that they would tie together and they would put a yoke on them and they would pull, um, what are they called? When they would make the, the, the things in the ground. Plows? Yeah, exactly. They would put, they'd put these plows on these animals and they would have to work together. You know, that's like putting an ox with a, with a donkey. You know, that ox is going to pull more of that weight. Or you put a big old horse, big old strong workhorse with a pony. <laughs> That's going to look, the pony may not even reach. He's trying to get up there in the, in the yoke. These different things that he's saying, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, if you, if you got married and neither one of you were Christians and one got saved, that's a different story. We'll go into that a little bit later on. But he's saying that you have the ability to stay away from being yoked to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Being bound to the wrong person. And I understand that people say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And before, and before marriage, when people are courting or dating, they, they say whatever just to, <laughs> just to tie the knot. They'll say whatever. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Oh, yeah, I'm this. Oh, yeah, I'm that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why the dating process is 
such an important stage in life because you begin to see how they are. You begin to see how they act. So it said, if you want to know a person, make them mad. You want to know how they really are? Make them mad. Not, I'm not talking about all the time. <laughs> not all the time, but that's how you begin to see a person's true colors. Because especially when you're dating, man, everyone's dressed in their nines. Their all, attitude is up to par, man. Everything is all nice and gravy, right? But it becomes once you get married that you start to see the, as they would say, the ugly side of marriage. Now I have to live with you. Now I have to put up with these. You know, and, and, and these different things take place. You know, I, I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know you were that weird. I didn't know you were strange. And I didn't know you had all of these different quirks about you. But that's why being honest and upfront is important as well. Hey, this is me. Take it or leave it. But people have that mentality so much. Well, you're going to love me for who I am. Right? No. <laughs> if you're a mean ogre and you are ugly, mean old grumpy troll, no one's going to want to be with you. And if you want Prince Charming to come sweep you off your feet, you may need to change, sweetheart. <laughs> Same with the young men. That if you want to find that princess that you've always been looking for, then, then quit being arrogant and proud. Be humble sometimes. You know, be, be nice and kind, not Mr. Casanova trying to get all the girls who talk to you and look your way. Oh, she likes me. Not what? She probably looking to see, oh man, that dude's ugly. Look at him. <laughs> look, look how ugly that guy is. You know? These different things that, that, that men, unsaved men have issues. Unsaved men only want one thing. And if you, if you don't know what that is, get with me after Bible study. I used to be an unsaved man, and I can speak from experience. But when you get somebody that cares more about your spirit and your soul than he does your body, things become easier. Things become easier. When I was, when I was dating my wife, I was working with an older gentleman. He was probably close to his 70s. And we, I was talking to him, and I was saying all the positive things that I liked about her. This, well, whatever, we were just talking. He was, he was my, my supervisor at the time. And he was like, brother, let me tell you something. When you're, looking for, when you're looking for a woman, a woman that knows how to cook is great. A woman that's clean and, and dresses well, that's a blessing. He said, but forget all of that. Forget all of that, because if she loves God, she'll love you. If she loves God, she'll be on your team. She'll be on your side. And she'll be there to help you. She'll be the help me that you need. All of these things. Find a woman that loves God. I'm here to tell you tonight, young man. Find a woman that loves God. Because if she loves God, she'll love you. Young ladies, older ladies, same thing. Same thing. That when people have that true heart of God and that care for God and that love for God, it will show in their relationships. It will show in how they go about their very lives. And I'm, I'm way over time. I'm over time by three minutes. I still have a ton to, to, to go over. So we'll pick it up next week. We'll pick it up next week. Um, same time, same place. Part two. There's a lot. There's really a lot in this. A lot in this. Knowing. Knowing. How to find the right one. Again. And then I, 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 I hit this real, real quick. That, that I knew my wife was a Christian. She knew I was a Christian. Boom. Unequally yoked. Box check. We don't have to worry about it. We got that clear. We're, we're equally yoked. Now people say, well, how do I know? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? Well, that's the big one. That's the big one. If you're equally yoked, if you can be equally yoked together, that's the biggest one. Now you just have to figure out if your personalities go together. You know, learning each other, uh, talking with each other, going out, you know, uh, with each other, uh, not at night, not privately. Don't, 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 don't go swooping up at, at midnight. Hey, girl, how you doing? <laughs> What's, what you up to? I know rallies is still open. What's up? You know, these different things. But making sure that we are keeping ourselves, keeping ourselves, because 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, it says that it is not right for a man to touch a woman. It, is, it, it isn't right for a man to touch a woman. And 
Um, I'm not saying that kissing is a sin. I'm not saying holding hands is a sin. But all of that with the hormones? Come on now. There's no, there's no way that you're going to tell me that you can sit there and smooch and then just say, all right, goodbye, have a good one. We'll see you later. No. I used to be a teenager before. Just putting that out there. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know if y'all knew that. <laughs> I used to be young once, once upon a time. And these different things. So we have to remember that if we are keeping ourselves, that's what he's saying. Ooh, 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 ooh. For ye are the temple of the living God. God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I care more about if God receives me. I, I, this is what I care more about. The relationship I have with my Savior. That is the thing that's going to drive a Christian to, to abstain from anything that will cause them to go to hell. Amen. We have to remember that. Have to remember that. Now I'm five minutes over. Six minutes over. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your love, your kindness, and your goodness. And also, God, I want to thank you for your, your word. That your word is truth and we can stand on your word and, and take it to the bank knowing the promises that are there are for us. God, I pray that you would allow this word of God to be in our hearts and in our minds. That we can live holy and separated unto you, God. I pray that you would continue to go with us and be with us as we go from this place. But never from you, Lord. And bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.